With climate change and other environmental crises becoming a regular topic on the global stage, focus on animal conservation is now greater than ever. Governments have begun issuing legislation to protect endangered populations, and conservationists on the ground work tirelessly to keep these animals safe. Yet even with so much around-the-clock effort, not every species can be saved. Such was the case for one group of, of animals who, after existing unbothered since the age of the dinosaurs, found themselves on a crash course toward extinction. Sadly, their numbers just recently reached zero, and the cause of their demise is nothing short of heartbreaking. Most people have a cursory knowledge of how diverse our planet is, though the true number of creatures we share our home with is staggering. There are currently 8.7 million different species on Earth. Of these millions, 41,415 are listed as endangered, with 16,306 of these species considered virtually extinct. This may not seem like many when compared to the greater 8.7 million, but some of these creatures are the most recognizable in nature. Giant pandas, Asian elephants, sea otters, snow leopards, and even tigers are among those species listed as endangered. With their complete loss, not only would the world be deprived of their beauty, but their respective ecosystems would be thrown into chaos. Even on a smaller scale, the loss of one species can completely derail an ecosystem. And for the creatures of China's Yangtze River, the disappearance of one creature is being felt tenfold. That creature was the Cephurus gladius, also known as the Chinese paddlefish. A dinosaur in its own right, this unusual-looking creature had existed for more than 200 million years. In fact, during its heyday, the Chinese paddlefish was one of the world's most prevalent fish species. With some growing up to 23 feet long and weighing up to 1,000 pounds, this curious creature was also one of the largest freshwater fish in the world. For centuries, the fish called a number of East Asian rivers home, though by the 1950s they could only be found in the waters of the Yangtze. By 1996, the Chinese paddlefish was listed as a critically endangered species. Conservation efforts to protect the paddlefish began soon after, though by the early 2000s, researchers couldn't locate enough fish in the wild to study. But in 2003, a group of fishery scientists devised a new strategy to keep tabs on the dwindling population. After managing to capture a Chinese paddlefish, the scientists fixed it with an ultrasonic tracker before releasing it back into the water. Unfortunately, the hard rocks of the Yangtze knocked the tracker loose, the species was never seen again. For a time, the fate of the Chinese paddlefish remained a mystery, though in 2017, Chinese scientists decided to find a definitive answer. With the help of researchers from the Czech Academy of Sciences and the UK's University of Kent, they hoped to catalogue every fish species in the Yangtze. Over the course of the study, the group surveyed the main arm of the Yangtze, its tributaries, and the Donjing and Poyang lakes and came away with an impressive catalogue. Sadly, of the 332 fish species identified, none of them were the Chinese paddlefish. Thus, in 2019, the International Union for Conservation of Nature IUCN, declared the Chinese paddlefish officially extinct. We respect the evaluation model and experts from the IUCN, although we accept this result with a heavy heart, said Wei Kiwei, the study's co-author. In the report, several factors were cited as the cause of the Chinese paddlefish's untimely demise. The first was pollution, as the Yangtze has seen a dramatic uptick in waste dumping over the last century. The second, and perhaps most damning, factor was the construction of dams and other diversions. In fact, many consider the building of the Gejoba Dam and Three Gorges Dam to have been the first major blow to the Chinese paddlefish's survival. This is because the dams blocked the migratory routes of the fish and split the population into two isolated groups. From there, it became increasingly difficult for adult Chinese paddlefish to swim upstream to breed as well as for young fish to travel downstream to feed. Overfishing also played a significant role in the species' extinction, as young Chinese paddlefish were small enough to be caught by traditional fishing methods. Combine this fact with the heavy water traffic on the Yangtze, and the fish sadly never stood a chance. Loss of such unique and charismatic megafauna representative of freshwater ecosystems is a reprehensible and an irreparable loss, said Wei. Yet there may actually be a silver lining to the demise of the Chinese paddlefish. On January 8, 2020, the Chinese government issued a 10-year commercial fishing ban that covered 332 conservation sites along the Yangtze. And just a year later, the ban is set to expand to include the main river course and its tributaries as well. The Chinese government hopes to avoid any further disappearance of the Yangtze's unique aquatic life, as many of the creatures that swim the waters are also endangered. In fact, 
Two species, the Reeves shad in the Yangtze River dolphin, are already listed as functionally extinct. And for the optimists out there, some hope can be had from the fact that a handful of extinct species have made unexpected comebacks in recent years. Maybe, after the pollution clears and the dams are demolished, the Chinese paddlefish will swim the Yangtze once more. Yet the threat of extinction still weighs heavily on many animals outside of China, including on the aptly named little penguin. A native of Australia and New Zealand, the species' rapid decline came as quite the surprise to their human neighbors. After all, people had been journeying just south of Melbourne to Phillip Island to watch these little birds travel to and from the ocean for their nightly penguin parade, for almost a century. But the parades nearly ended, and for good, too. Due to an influx of foxes and other predators, the helpless penguins found themselves hunted down at an extreme rate. On one gruesome day, predators killed 180 of the poor penguins. By 2015, conservationists could only find six penguins on the entire island. Park rangers on Phillip Island had a real problem on their hands. Aside from the tourism revenue that kept the reserve going, the near extinction of the little penguins threatened the entire ecosystem. Nobody was quite sure what to do. But then a colorful chicken farmer named Swampy Marsh stepped forward. He had a trick he used in his everyday work that he figured might just save the plummeting penguin population. To keep his flock of chickens safe from any would-be hunters, Swampy invested in a few Marema sheepdogs to prowl his fields. These born herders chased away predators while also moving the birds to safer locations when needed. If the Maremas could shield some chickens, he wondered, could they do the same for penguins? Phillip Island understood they had no other real option. They got to training some dogs as soon as they could. Before long, Phillip Island set the dogs out on guard patrol. The Maremas didn't even have handlers with them. A self-reliant breed, they alone covered the expanse of the island. The park rangers waited with bated breath. Sure enough, the sheepdogs did the trick. Foxes and other predators fled to the mainland, and the little penguin community started bouncing back. Soon, in fact, their numbers climbed back into the triple digits. The Marema experiment was such a success that it inspired a family film called Oddball. However, another species threatened the struggling birds, mankind. Man-made disasters pose possibly the biggest threat to endangered species all over the world. For the little penguins, recent oil spills off the Australian coast wreaked havoc to their habitat. Fortunately, conservation groups stepped in to help clean up the animals and their homes. But one quick scrub couldn't wash away the entire problem. The oil spill can cause longer-lasting problems, like reducing the penguins' ability to retain body heat. As luck would have it, a novel solution would come from these halls in southwest Australia. But make no mistake, this was no laboratory or gifted school. The penguin savior would come from a nursing home. Alfie Date was already remarkable, as he held the title of Australia's oldest man. Nevertheless, even at 109 years of age, he still had the energy to make a difference. Moved by the penguin story, he pulled out some yarn and his knitting needles. With no time to lose, Alfie started knitting up a storm. A stack of colorful garments piled up next to his chair. Once Alfie's hands couldn't make one more stitch, he called the nurses to ship his hard work off to Phillip Island. Crazy as it sounds, Alfie knitted sweaters for the penguins, and it worked. The perfectly sized clothing kept the birds warm and improved their buoyancy in the water. Plus, they didn't look half bad. Once other Australians got wind of Alfie's heroic craftsmanship, they began sending their own penguin sweaters to Phillip Island, with some really cool designs to boot. You could almost say that Alfie's sweater gambit worked a little too well. Staff on Phillip Island became so overwhelmed with penguin clothing that they had to ask people to stop sending it over. The birds only needed the sweaters for a short while, and yet park rangers had enough to put on a whole fashion show. However, the sweaters going viral raised a ton of awareness about the little penguin's plight. People all over the world, not just around Melbourne, took notice of just how important these birds were to the ecosystem. Ever since, the penguins' numbers have continued their steady growth. Whoever thought a few dogs and some knitting could save an entire population from the brink of extinction? Researchers in other parts of the world saw dwindling populations of another species. In the deep dark corners of the Bolivian rainforest, for instance, there lived this frog with a wide brown body, big green eyes, and an orange chest holding an empty heart. He was alone. He had been for a very, very long time. There, from the tropical freshwater marsh, he was captured by scientists who had never laid eyes on one of his kind before. To further study him, they brought the fat-bellied frog back to their labs. Ever since that day, the frog had been living at the Cochabamba Natural History Museum where he was given the name, Romeo. 
The question for the lonely frog was this, would he find his one true love? Or would, love be a smoke made with the fume of sighs? See, at first, researchers and frog experts assumed that Romeo was the very last Sewenka's water frog remaining on Earth. After all, his habitat has been greatly affected by deforestation and climate change. But both the researchers and Romeo refused to give up hope. Their new goal for the next decade was to find him a Juliet. If the two got along, he would no longer be lonely, and if they really got along, they might be able to repopulate the Sewenka's species. For the scientists, boosting the frog population was a beneficial goal in more ways than one. They'd save another species from extinction, further study these little guys, and restore balance in the delicate ecosystem of the Amazon rainforest. Thus, the biologists got to work. They searched endlessly throughout the forest and even created a profile for Romeo on Match.com. Still, for an entire decade, one remained the loneliest number. Zoologist Teresa Camacho then led a frog search expedition in December of 2018. She and her team would stick their hands in creeks and feel for water frogs since the creatures can't easily be spotted underwater. We were tired, wet and disappointed, said Camacho, who believes that contaminated waterways on top of all the other habitat changes have driven the Sewenka's water frog close to extinction. Then I said, let's do one more creek. Suddenly, Camacho and her team heard a tiny splash and noticed some movement in the water. They reached for the creature right away but alas, it was an entirely different species of frog. However, not all hope was lost. That frog jumped away, leading the team to a tiny waterfall. There, underneath the stream of a little crashing wave, researchers saw a brown frog with big green eyes and an orange belly. Unfortunately, this frog would not be Romeo's partner in repopulating the species. While this little fella could have been great company to the museum loner, he was a male. Still, this meant there were more Sewenkas out there. There was hope to finding Romeo a Juliet. The next day, the crew returned to the creek one more time and, bingo! They managed to catch four more frogs, two males and two females. While three of them were too young to reproduce, one female was exactly the right age. Now all they needed was some chemistry. Although Romeo found no luck in online dating, this adult female could very well be the one. Could his life of isolation finally be over? It was a tough call because she had a completely opposite personality from Romeo's. Romeo is really calm and relaxed and doesn't move a whole lot, Camacho Bedini told BBC. Juliet, she said, was really energetic, she swims a lot and she eats a lot and sometimes she tries to escape. On Valentine's Day of 2019, the two love frogs would be set up on their very first date in the hopes of procreating and saving their entire species. No pressure, though, right? If their personalities weren't compatible, the looks could be all they needed. She has beautiful eyes, Alcide Dorbini Museum director Ricardo Cespedes said about Juliet, who was quarantined until lab tests come back. Scientists needed to make sure she was free of the dangerous chytrid fungus, known to have killed entire frog populations, before she met Romeo. Otherwise, she could have done much more harm than good. Romeo was actually quite shy, didn't swim much, and was a little overweight, but that could change. We'll have to provide some sort of current to get him a little more exercise, Camacho said. If Romeo didn't get kissed and turned into a prince, there were always a few other solutions. The biologists could attempt in vitro fertilization or rely on the younger frogs to breed when they were ready. The Bolivian Museum of Natural History has previously succeeded in preserving the rare Titicaca frog, so if anyone is up to saving the Sewenkas, it's these well-trained experts. Now all there was left to do was wait for Valentine's Day and see whether the Montague Capulet romance would bloom. At least for now, Romeo no longer has to live in solitude, and there's gonna be one less lonely frog.